I apologize for being late since I, I thought this event started at 4.30. I'm E. Ann Kaplan. I am the permanent director of the Institute. However, the reason I'm so uh, distracted is that I'm on research leave. However, I'm here this week and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this wonderful event. Uh, the Institute has collaborated with School of uh, Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. We've worked on the Climates Institute for years, several years with them. So this is a wonderful follow-up and we're delighted to have you here. All I'm going to do, uh, having said that, is just announce a couple of the upcoming events that still remain in the Institute for this spring semester. Um, on Thursday, April 29th, there will be the third, I think it is, or is it the fourth of the Early Modernities talk. Wendy Wall will talk about In Memory's Kitchen, Preservation and Early Modern Recipes. Sounds tasty, right? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and that will be at 5 p.m. in Humanities 1008 across the way. And on Tuesday, April 27th, just a, bit, a couple of days before, Meredith McGill from Rutgers will be talking about Western poetry, poetic form and the transmission of culture. So these events you'll be getting them probably on Kindle computers. Uh, you're all welcome to everything the Institute does. And let me now hand over to Steve Spector, who's already present, uh, or Malcolm going to be next. We've got so many speakers here this afternoon, we don't even know who speaks. Well, but thank you, Ben. Um, I'm Malcolm Bowman. Just some announcements about Earthstock that's running all this week. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we have some great events this week. Tomorrow at 3 o'clock, we have the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Dr. Rose, Asha Rose Magiro, coming to study. She's the number two woman at the United, the number two person at the United Nations. And she will be giving an address in the Wong Center at 3 o'clock on the role of women and the environment in developing society. So this should be especially interesting. And we followed by a four-member panel of distinguished women, plus a moderator who is the only male uh, on the program, and that is uh, yours truly. So <laughs> come along tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Then on Friday, we have the big celebration all day on the Academic Mall. Jeff Barnett standing there at the, uh, at the back. Jeff, Jeff is the admin co-chair. I'm the academic co-chair, and there's Rizwana here, the student co-chair. There's Rizwana. Stand up, Rizwana. <laughs> First Friday, all day long, 11 to 3. And then in the evening, um, Professor Carl Safina, the, the famous ocean conservationist, is giving a presentation again at the Wong Theatre at 7.30 p.m. What's the title of your talk, Carl? Uh, all in the same net, the oceans and us. Carl has a new book coming out in September. It will be his fifth book, and he, this will be uh, a chance for you to learn about that. So um, the only other thing I wanted to say was uh, those students of my three classes, you can get extra credit, so Alex is handing around the sign-up sheet. And I just want to spend just a few seconds telling you about parliamentary debating, because some of you may not be familiar with it, what it is, and the, everyone should have got a sheet at the beginning. Parliamentary debating is these are the rules of the American Parliamentary Debate Association and, and colleges all around the country debate according to these rules. Basically, we have two teams. We have a government on this side and we have the opposition. And then in the middle we have the Speaker of the House. So this is based on the parliamentary system you find in Britain or in Europe. But if you think of it in terms of if we were Congress, you know, depending on who's in power, it could be Democrats, Republicans, or vice versa. So you think of it that way. There are strict rules of encounter. I'm not going to go through them all. They're all on the sheet. But there are six speeches altogether, starting with the Prime Minister. You can see the order and timing of speeches. And the, the teams can interrupt. If we think something's unclear, I can stand up and ask the speaker for a point of information. There's some strange argument the other side is making that we don't understand. The speaker, the person who's debating, can choose to ignore me standing up or can choose to answer it. And I can stay standing up until I feel justice has been served. And then there's points of order. Points of order is when one team thinks the other team is breaking the rules. Going on too long, bringing up spurious arguments. Uh, and in the end, in the two final speeches are called rebuttal. No new arguments. 
we brought up the rebuttal. It can just be trying to rubbish the other side's arguments. And then finally, there's something called points of personal privileges. Personal point, point of personal privilege is where one debater feels he or she has been grossly insulted by something the other team said about their person. All right? That's what I want to say about the rules. Now, you as the audience have several important roles. You're encouraged, if you so feel moved, to make witty comments. You can all, you can all say, boring, or snore. Let me hear you all snore. <laughs> but it's got to be witty, it's got to be quick, it's up to the speaker to keep control, but you are supposed to participate. And the second important thing you do at the end is that you vote. You vote who is the winner, by show of hands, and the speaker will take account. We have a timekeeper here, Rachel, and she is, uh, and she's going to keep the speakers on time. There will be time signals that you will see. Two minutes to go, one minute to go, sit down and shut up. It's up to the speaker to enforce that. Right? Absolutely. So with that, I'm now retracting from this role, and now I've become a debater. Stephen? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Stephen Spector, Chairman of English. By some strange logic peculiar to the academic world, a medievalist who works with evangelical Christians was asked to introduce this debate. Um, but it turns out that it's possible just by looking at the debates among the evangelicals to set up the actual basis of the disagreement. For example, James Inhofe, who is a Republican senator from Oklahoma, has said that UN, the UN and climate change scientists are perpetrating a hoax. So basically, they are after grant money, and especially from the Heinz Foundation, so that's a kind of dig at, at uh, the Democrats. And when he was asked why the Pentagon, in its quadrennial re review, said that climate change poses a threat of global conflict, he said, well, you know that the Pentagon's uh, point of view is dictated by the White House. There are other traditionalist evangelical Christians who take the same viewpoint. For example, James Dobson, who until recently was head of focus on the family, who does agree that there's a kind of stewardship that is required of humans. Because in Genesis 1, God says, man should have dominion over the earth. And therefore, man should have stewardship over the earth. But it also means, from a traditionalist Christian point of view, for some of them, that if man has dominion, then the earth is, is, is made for man's benefit and man is at man's disposal. And he should not be restricting his prosperity based on caring for the earth. Um, Richard Land, who was the head of the Southern Baptist Convention's political wing, and advised Karl Rove and George Bush every week at a tele teleconference call, uh, says that the science itself is bad. And you may think, well, this is religious fanaticism. I know Richard Land quite well, and he helped me write the book that I just produced. Land is a graduate of Princeton in history and of Cambridge in theology, and he is one of the most intelligent men I know. There must be at least some point of view that he can argue well on that point. But on the other side of the evangelical spectrum, 280 evangelical leaders signed an evangelical climate initiative in which they said that man is given stewardship over the earth and man should take responsibility for protecting the earth. And they include Leif Anderson, who's the head of the National Association of Evangelicals, and Joel Hunter, who prays with Obama over the phone, sends him devotionals. So on the one hand, aligned against this among the evangelicals, people who advise Bush. And on the other, people who are close to, to Obama and, and even pray with him. And with that, I'll, introduce, I'll hand this over to the debaters. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> I'm Jim Kmerfeld. I'm the uh, speaker of the referee today. I'm a visiting professor of journalism. Uh, I spent almost 40 years in those days the editor of the editorial pages. So I'm well suited for this job. You know, an editorial writer is one who waits for people to take an action and we come down and we shoot the wounded. <laughs> We're going to be debating today the question specifically is be it resolved that human intervention can control climate change in the next 25 years to avoid a global catastrophe. And to do uh, the debating, we have a distinguished panel. First of all, on my immediate right is Dr. Carl Safina, who will be the Prime Minister arguing uh, the case. 
He brought ocean uh, conservation into the uh, environmental mainstream. Audubon magazine named him among the leading 100 conservationists of the 20th century. His writing has been featured in National Geographic, the New York Times, elsewhere. His 100 plus publications include the books of Song for the Blue Ocean, Eye of the Albatross, Voyage of the Turtle, Nina Delmar and the Great Whale Rescue and the upcoming The View from Lazy Point. The Environmental Defense Fund lists songs for the Blue Ocean among the 13 most influential environmental books of all time. He's been profiled by the New York Times, Nightline, and Bill Moyers. His awards include a Pew Fellowship, Landon Literary Award, John Burroughs Medal, and the MacArthur Genius Prize, among others. He is founding president of the Blue Ocean Institute and an adjunct professor at Stony Brook School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. To help me welcome Carl. Thank you. Now to help me to help Carl, his uh, member, government member, who you all well know is Professor Malcolm Bowman, who's a professor of oceanography. Um, and uh, a distinguished for, uh, service professor here at Stony Brook, uh, and he's the man most responsible for setting all of this up and bringing us together today. So welcome, Malcolm Bowman. <laughs> now, in the opposition, we have an old friend of mine who I worked with for many years when I was in Newsday. Uh, I still remember him throwing books at me when he didn't like what I wrote. <laughs> he's a very calm guy about these things. None of that today, Lee. Uh, this is Dr. Lee Koppelman, uh, who's the head of the Center for Regional Policy Studies here at Stony Brook. He was a longtime director of planning in Suffolk County and the director of the Bi-County Regional Planning Board. And I can't begin to tell you all the good things that he's done for all of us here on Long Island uh, in terms of the environment. Lee, thank you for your great time. To my extreme right is my good friend. Howard Schneider, who's the Dean of the School of Journalism now. He spent, I think, 37 years at Newsday. 35. 35 <laughs> years at Newsday. Uh, he was a reporter, uh, he was managing editor, and he was editor-in-chief of Newsday. And he's now uh, created the first undergraduate school of journalism in the entire New York State University system. So Howard, thank you for participating. <laughs> Safina will make the case. He has eight minutes to make his opening case. Seven. 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 <laughs> Just lost a minute. <laughs> this is about whether we can control climate change. Whether we will is not the question of this debate. And yes, we can. We cannot erase the changes we've already caused, but we can avoid making things much worse by switching to clean fuels. First, a little bit about the physics. CO2, carbon dioxide, and other gases trap heat like a greenhouse. Without this greenhouse effect, planet Earth would be too cold for life. But since the Industrial Revolution, CO2 has risen about a third. That is a staggering change to our planet. That change mainly comes from the coal and oil we burn. These are dirty fuels. Technologies exist for a switch to clean, limitless energy that will stabilize climate change, keep our money inside our own country, clear our skies, and even clean our seafood because the mercury in seafood comes mainly from burning coal. Getting there will mean reasserting US leadership, which appeals to my patriotic side, and revitalizing factories and creating jobs across America's depressed rust belt. For all these reasons, we need new energy. Fortunately, the switch is quite feasible. Here's the vision. One, we need a national smart grid capable of moving energy from where it's abundant to where it's needed. Designing and building it means putting America back to work and tremendous opportunities for investors. Two, once built, this grid can transmit electricity generated by any means, whether coal, oil, nuclear, burning trash, hydropower, wind, solar, geothermal, tidal, or, journal, or gerbils running laps. <laughs> of these, hydropower, wind, solar, geothermal, and tidal energy sources are clean and safe. 
Gerbils are not clean. We had some at home. <laughs> and those sources come free to the grid. They cannot be exhausted. Clean, free, eternal energy. That's quite a bargain. Three, other countries will be forced to catch up with us and buy our technology made in the USA. One, two, three. That's the vision. Some people say it's too expensive. Is free energy too expensive? I don't think so. So why do some people say we can't afford free energy? The dirty energy we have seems cheap because the pricing is dishonest. The true cost of dirty fuels involves the effects of changing climate and oceans getting acidified. And we pay those costs anyway. Consider a few of these costs. To agriculture, increasing heat hurts crops. Rather stunningly, at nighttime temperatures above 105 Fahrenheit, rice fails. Who do you think will pay? Sea level rise. Americans already pay hundreds of millions to put sand back on East Coast beaches, eroding as the sea rises. In the Pacific and Asia and the Arctic, people are already being forced to move inland from flooded farms, villages, and wells. Millions may have to move. Who will pay? Fisheries losses. Acidifying water is already wiping out oyster hatcheries on the west coast. It will destroy coral reefs and all their fisheries. Who do you think will pay? Social unrest. Some of the first climate refugees are already fighting with locals. Who do you think will pay? These costs are not in your energy bill, but you pay in your other bills. For example, the true cost of a gallon of gasoline is about $15. We do pay those costs with our taxes, our medical bills, and the blood of war. Meanwhile, though, ExxonMobil gets rich and funds campaigns telling us that free energy is too expensive. But its days are numbered regardless. Now, stabilizing atmospheric carbon dioxide means cutting carbon dioxide emissions about 80% and soon. How? One, raising energy efficiency. Two, ending deforestation with sustainable forestry and three, eliminating oil and coal-fired power plants. Let's look at efficiencies first. Remember, we're looking for emissions that are only 20% of current levels. The most efficient refrigerators use 13% as much as the average American refrigerator. A refillable glass bottle uses 10% of the energy needed for recycling an aluminum can. Merely using the most efficient practices now available the petrochemical industry could cut energy use 30%, manufacturing could cut energy 25%, cement making efficiencies would save 40%, retrofitting old buildings could save 20 to 50%, and in new buildings the gains are much more substantial. That's just a rough first cut with what we already know right at this moment. Let's look at lighting efficiency. Fluorescent bulbs use 25% of the energy of incandescent bulbs. Light-emitting diodes use only 20% of the energy of incandescent bulbs, and that's our target. Already, New York City has replaced bulbs and traffic lights with LEDs, annually saving $6 million, enough to keep SUNY Southampton open. <laughs> Our failure is a failure of our imagination. Other countries are not so dumb. Australia is phasing out incandescence this year, Canada by 2012, China by 2017. By 2016, the world's largest lighting manufacturer will market only fluorescent lights in Europe. European countries are far ahead of the USA. Germans have cut coal 40% in 20 years through increasing efficiency and wind energy. Here are some other comparisons to coal. There are now about 2,400 coal plants worldwide. <clears throat> Officials say in 10 years we'll need 1,400 more, not necessarily. Changing all the lights to fluorescence would save enough to avoid building 700 of those plants. We could avoid building 690 more if, solar power, if the solar power capacity of present-day <coughs> Turkey was used by the whole developing world. If the electricity used by US appliances in standby mode dropped from 5% to 1%, we could avoid building 17 coal-fired plants. In other words, we don't need no more stinking coal plants. <laughs> MIT has estimated that the cost of building one coal-fired plant 
I'm sorry, for, for the cost of building one coal-fired plant, the U.S. could produce geothermal electricity equal to 250 coal plants. And if we replace the coal, we save half the diesel fuel used in U.S. rail freight because half the diesel is used to move coal on trains. Kicking coal makes so much sense that Texas, Kansas, Minnesota, and Florida have canceled plans to build coal plants, so yes, we can. Now, the leader of the opposition, Dr. Lee Koppelman, and he has, does have eight, eight minutes. I'd like to use 30 seconds of my eight minutes to correct my colleague Steve. His quote uh, as a Christian theologian that we are shepherds of the earth, etc., and so forth, did not originate with his particular uh, choice. Uh, I'd refer you to Leviticus and Deuteronomy of the Old Testament. Is it Genesis? <laughs> it started in Genesis. I you. So uh, <laughs> there are other sects that could lay original claim to your comment. In terms of the thesis, which my distinguished colleague, Prime Minister, rewrote, the subject of today's debate is that in the next quarter century, the issue of controlling climate change is doable. And as the leader of the opposition, I would have to strongly disagree. Because we're not talking about, can we come up with technologies that are more energy efficient? The answer is yes, he's correct. Can we come up with technologies that avoid some of the existing problems? The answer, of course, is yes. The place where the answer is no is that we're not talking about potentially available technologies or, in his judgment, that economically they are equal. We're talking about the reality of economic truth, whether we like it or not, and we're also talking about the reality of public policy. From a standpoint of public policy, our distinguished prime minister referred primarily to the United States using some international examples that serve his argument. But let us get real. Every nation in the world, from a standpoint of their policy, is to do what is in the best interest of their particular country. That's one of the reasons the United States was lagging in any of the conferences dealing with any aspect of the environment, let alone global warming, because it did interfere in terms of a politician's interest in terms of current economic concern. Oil is not disappearing, coal is not disappearing, and as long as it is there, there'll be interest that will support its continued use. Now, in terms of trying to get a handle on global climate. CEO of Shell Oil says oil is disappearing, and he's expecting a peak in a few years. Yes, they're saying it's disappearing, and I've heard these comments for the last 50 years, and then you come up with new discoveries, and they say, aha, we've got other sources. So if you're worried that your car's going to run out of gas, that's a fallacy. Now, let's get to public policy. It is not in China's interest with 1.2 billion people whose primary source of energy is coal. And I might point out high sulfur soft coal. So if you want to look at epidemiological evidence on diseases related to pollution, China is one of the leaders in the world. They've had more than double digit increase in their economy. And it was primarily because they've ignored the environmental consequences. They made a policy decision that the economy is going to grow and the hell with the environmental downside. And it is not in their current interest or in the coming 25 years to do something inimical to that interest. And the same holds in the United States. Oil is still a major political force, including their ability to elect presidents of the United States. 
and that's not going to disappear in the next 20 or 25 years. That happens to be the reality. So if we want to talk about incremental improvements, certainly those who are environmentally conscious will do precisely what our distinguished prime minister has called for. But let me point out, in all of the environmental studies that I've done over the last 50 years, convincing the general public that they should do what's in the environment's interest only works when their particular ox is being gored. People support open space acquisition because they don't want new residents in their neighborhood. They're not environmentally conscious. It's an argument that works in their favor. So when we talk about the ability, in a sense, to control climate, I'd have to point out that global warming is not solely man's activity. For those who don't like developed countries, that's an argument that could be raised. But there are at least a half a dozen other factors that contribute and have contributed since this planet was formed to global warming. And one of the key elements is solar energy. Change what the sun is producing, and you will change whether you're going through global warming or global cooling. The only point I would respectfully agree with the government is that, yes, we in our own government, if we have the will, and if we want to allocate the money, and that becomes a congressional choice, we may make some improvements at the fringes. Just look at any environmental issue and look at the years it has taken to achieve accomplishment. When we talk about 20 or 25 years, that's a mini second in terms of how public policy shifts. Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Two minutes. It took one century for a simple thing like civil rights to begin to be carried out in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act. This is now 2010, and I would defy the government or anyone in this audience to say there's no discrimination against minorities in the United States. And that's a simple problem. Now when we take complex problems like climate, the Weather Bureau meteorologists, they can't tell you with accuracy what the climate's going to be next week. <laughs> and the United Nations will tell you in the year 3000, we got sea level rise. Our distinguished prime minister used coastal erosion as an example of global warming and sea level rise. I would hate to differ with him, but I've done a lot of research in coastal erosion. And let me tell you people, that coastal erosion has been a fact of coastal areas long before mankind had an industrial revolution. And the fact is that lead to erosion on the seashore is beyond the issue of global warming. And I'd also point out, since sea level rise is so strenuously mentioned, New York City is going to be flooded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The average sea level rise has been about a tenth of an inch a year. So in 20 years, you can calculate what the sea level rise is going to be. And if you want to talk about glaciation, the federal government itself, if you trust the government, and we in the opposition do not, there are more polar bears in the Arctic now than there have been since they've been taking inventories of polar bears. Fine. So I thank you for your attention. Dr. Malcolm Bowman, you have eight minutes, Dr. Bowman. My esteemed uh, opponent, Dr. Koppelman, has made some very compelling arguments. And he, was, he has told us about the, the dangers ahead and the political difficulties that lie, not just on the natural, national scene, but globally. I agree. The problems are immense. There are dozens of books out there that say the easy road to being green, save the planet, and do it in your spare time. It's all ridiculous. We're faced with, we live on the eve of destruction of civilization as we know it. 
if we do not act. So the dangers are there and the difficulties are enormous. It's going to take a revolution in the way societies are built, get their energies. And the point of the argument that my esteemed Prime Minister and myself are making is to convince you that we can. We have the tools, if we have only the political will, we can. Let's just talk about gasoline for a minute. Did you know the United States consumes more gasoline than China, Japan, Germany, Russia, Brazil, plus the next 16 largest countries combined? We could easily do much better. By 2012, New York and San Francisco plan to have all their taxi fleets hybrid vehicles, getting 40 miles to the gallon. New plug-in hybrid vehicles are coming out that will do much better than that, providing transportation to the equivalent of what we pay as $1 per gallon. If our vehicles are built in, with polymer materials like jumbo jets, they will be much lighter, and that will have an enormous effect on the mileage of cars. A large part of our answer is blowing in the wind. Since 2000, worldwide energy generating capacity has been doubling every three years. China has enough wind blowing to easily double its whole electrical generating capacity if it chooses. It's important to bring the world community together to face these problems. That happened last December in Copenhagen. A hundred nations came together and it showed just how difficult the problem is to solve. And none of us deny that. But we've, if we've got to move ahead, we have to know that the tools we have are realistic. The Department, U.S. Department of Energy has calculated that wind power could supply the whole electricity needs of our nation in North Dakota, Kansas, and Texas alone. A, 19, a 2004 assessment showed that all of Europe could meet their electricity demand through wind power. What about solar power? When you buy a solar unit for your roof, you are going to receive free energy through hot water and electricity for the next 25 years. In, in Europe in particular, the, there is widespread use of solar energy, both hot water and electricity, and we must follow that. Large hydro dams throughout the world provide only 16% of the world's energy at present. Water is powerful. We've hardly tapped that energy source. And then the ocean is full of energy through the giant currents, the tides. We must learn to find ways to harness that. Yes, we can. So what is possible? The futurist Lester Brown says reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% would require, among other things, building 1.5 million turbines. Wind turbines are now the number one export industry of the country of Denmark. China is, is building a huge wind power industry. We're losing the race. We have to get, we have to make our energies, our industries green. And as my esteemed Prime Minister said, create new industries that will develop the technologies, develop the infrastructure that will make all this possible. We can do it. So it sounds like a lot. It sounds like a lot of work. 1.5 million turbines. Do you know worldwide we make 65 million new cars every year? During World War II, President Roosevelt said, for three years, no new cars will be built. Instead, tanks and planes were built. It is possible if there is a collective will, nationally and globally, to start on this very difficult part. The whole tax system needs to be changed. Rather than a taxation on income that we presently have, we need a consumption, a tax on consumption. We'll move the burden towards a higher tax on consumption. The true cost of gasoline is, my, is about $15 a gallon. And yet at the pump we pay, it's going up, I know, $3 for regular. But there are hidden subsidies. Why is it, what's the difference between $12, $15, and $3? It's because there are hidden costs of extraction, of pollution, of health problems, of acidification of the oceans. 
that we're not paying for. So it's not three dollars is not a true cost. This is a folks, this is a call to patriotism. China and Taiwan have each overtaken the US in solar cell production. And our factories are allowed to rust away. The Chinese are using American capital from our huge trade imbalance. Two minutes. And then using this money to develop solar and wind technology, selling it back to us. We're losing the technology race. We have to get serious. It's not going to be easy. It's revolutionary. Yes, we can. With imagination, a lot can happen, Dr. Koppelman. Martin Luther King didn't say, gee, we have really big problems. He said, I have a dream. And a lot is happening that we I Americans sim <laughs> simply don't know about because we're sleeping rather than dreaming. The technology is already here. It will get better and better. We can do it. Let's go for it. Thank you. Member of the opposition, Dean Howard Schneider. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me first say, Mr. Speaker, that it is a privilege and an honor for me to be up here with members of the government. <laughs> Look at their credentials. These people are prominent conservationists and scientists. They are men of erudition, obviously. They are men of reason. They are men of great accomplishment and of commitment to saving the world. All of which makes it even more inexplicable to me how they can support such a half-baked proposition. Oh. Oh. I'm trying, I am trying to get them to say something. I don't really mean half-baked. What I really mean is flawed and very naive, okay? <laughs> so let me build on, on Dr. Koppelman's argument. Does anybody here really think that in two and a half decades we can tame the voracious economic appetites and the political self-interest of the 195 countries that cohabit on this earth. Does anybody think that between now and mid-century, and of the century, we can accommodate another 2.5 billion people? And that's the estimation. We're gonna grow by 2.5 billion, which was the whole population of the earth in 1950. Can we accommodate their expectations. Many of these new inhabitants will be aspiring Americans, in the word of the journalist Tom Friedman. They're going to want to increase their standard of living, and they're going to want to do it rapidly for themselves and their children. And the implications, the energy implications to feed these people, clothe these people, house these people, transport these people are enormous. And let me just tell you that these are the key questions, as Dr. Koppelman said, that will determine if this proposition can hold. It will not be, in all due respect, Professor Bowman's dreams. It won't be Professor Bowman's slogans. That's not going to hold it. So I have an idea. Mr. Speaker, I have an idea. The four of us should not debate this question. I have a whole new idea. What we really need in order to settle this argument and this would be the way to do it. Let's bring a representative from every country on the earth into this room. Let's give them the government's proposition, and let's see if they agree that it can be done. Would you all, how many of you would say that's a reasonable way of trying to see if this is possible? Raise your hand. I need more of you to raise your hand. <laughs> all right, that's, that's, that's why, wouldn't that work? We get everybody in the room, we say, here's the proposition, can it happen? Ladies and gentlemen, we don't need a crystal ball to find out what the answer is. We know the answer. And we know the answer, Dr. Bowman introduced that answer. Because in December, in fact, representatives from 195 countries came to Cop Copenhagen to try to solve this problem. High expectations. Two years after the Kyoto, a new president committed to this. And they arrived with great feelings that they could accomplish something. Dr. Bowman said it was a difficult meeting. He understates the case. They accomplished virtually nothing. And I'll tell you why, and I'll support that in a second. Nothing, no mandated reductions in caps, no mandates of any kind, 
no agreement for any kind of treaty. In fact, what Copenhagen did was expose all of the faults of the shaky foundation of the government's argument. It pitted, <laughs> it pitted rich nations against poor nations who demanded that the rich nations do a much better job of reducing carbon emissions and also asked for $100 billion in mitigation from the rich nations. It pitted, okay, coastal and island nations against the rest of the world and a ticking time bomb. Because these nations said, listen, if you don't reduce by 85%, 85%, if you can't get those carbon reductions by mid-century to 85% lower, we're gonna physically disappear. We won't exist. It pitted the OPEC nations against people who said, hey, wait a second, we want to produce more energy from renewables. We want more wind and solar. And the OPEC nation said, what's your hurry? And we've got a lot of leverage in the world, and we don't want to hurry that. It pitted European nations against other European nations. I think the prime minister indicated there's great progress, or Dr. Bowman, in Europe. So Europe signed, the European Union signed the Kyoto Accords. And they agreed to an 8% reduction in carbon emissions in the year 2012 over the year 1990. And guess what? Guess what? Not everybody's pulling their weight. So guess what? Spain can't meet that. Italy can't meet that goal. And who else can't meet that goal? Denmark, the host of the conference, can't meet that goal. The conference pitted those people who were for carbon taxing, right? against carbon traders. We can't even agree on a policy. Let me tell you that even though President Obama rushed in like a white knight at the last minute, you remember all that? And they negotiated an agreement with China and with Russia and with South Africa for some kind of statement that they could release, they did almost nothing. Almost nothing. So I want to tell you here that this is what President Obama himself said on the PBS NewsHour a couple of weeks after Copenhagen. This is his quote. I think that people are justified as being disappointed in the outcome in Copenhagen. The science says that we've got to significantly reduce em emissions over, over the next 40 years. There's nothing, I repeat that, there's nothing in the Copenhagen agreement that ensures that this happens. This is President Obama. We have heard the prime minister uh, and his, uh, his deputy, give us a lot of numbers. I'm gonna give you numbers. You want numbers? Here's some numbers. Here's what two polls taken before and after Copenhagen revealed about Americans. And the prime minister acknowledged if this will happen or can happen, we're gonna have to be the leader. <laughs> and here's what we found. Americans are less likely today, less likely to think this is a serious problem. They're less likely to say that this is a top priority of the government. They're less likely to say that global warming even exists. There's less likely to say that this is a big problem that will affect their life. And I have great documentation, and so I can read that for you. you for a concession to ignorance? Right. This is not ignorance, this is the public will. This is democracy. Okay. So listen, I have a confession. In my last 45 seconds, I have a confession. Would I rather argue the government side? Who would not want to argue transformative change against stagnation? Who would not want to argue optimism over certainly ambiguity and uncertainty? I have eight grandchildren. I'd want to argue this. But we have to understand, as Dr. Koppelman said, this is not the world we would like to see. This is the world as it is. Can we affect climate change? Absolutely. Can we influence it? Absolutely. Can we control this? We can't control a, 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 a renegade volcano in Iceland <laughs> that has basically, over the last week, paralyzed half the world. Not only Europe, I read today that Kenya, the Kenyan economy is in big trouble because it supplies many of its vegetables to Europe. The world can't cope with a runaway volcano. We can't control. Um. We can't control the traffic on Nichols Road. And so I would submit to you that should be the subject of our next debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. We will now hear from the leader of the opposition rebuttal. I remind you that in your rebuttal, you must deal with the points that have been made already. You can't raise new points.
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll try and remember the rules. In a sense, this debate is sort of preaching to the choir. If I asked for a show of hands, how many of you belong to the Tea Party, I don't think I'd see too many hands going up. Anyone? I listened to the arguments of my distinguished members of the government. I have no quarrel with their desires, but in terms of the reality, there's a big difference to what should have, could have, ought to be, and what is actually happening. At the most in the coming 25 years, as I tried to point out, I certainly expect to see some incremental improvements as more and more of the public become aware of some of the issues. But to suggest that there will be control, or to suggest that because we can develop the technologies, they, in fact, will supersede all else, is just a fantasy. That's not how public policy operates. Not here, not anywhere else. There's no national interest on the part of third world countries to be told that because of environmental concerns, they are not entitled to the same benefits that developed countries have. That was the argument I tried to raise in terms of national interest. And so perhaps the subject that Parliament is undertaking today was the wrong topic to begin with in terms of we can or we cannot control climate in the next 25 years. Perhaps the topic should have been, what do we have to do or can we do an implementation of these wonderful technologies Point of order. that are going to supplant? Point of order. My distinguished colleague must stick to the debate topic that was instigated. It's not up to my distinguished co colleague to suggest a new topic. Well, I beg to differ, sir, because the no, Prime I'm, Minister I'm, I'm changed gonna, the topic. I'm going to allow him to continue. I think he's on the topic. Thank you. In terms of where we're going to go in the next 25 years, the most that the environmental movement can strive for, and I believe the opposition is no less environmentally concerned than our distinguished colleagues in the government itself. But in a realistic sense, one has to focus on how public policy can be changed, and that would involve campaign finance reform, that would involve more direct political interest on the part of the electorate, all of the issues that are necessary for the people to have more input into the policies that our government actually carries out and the policies that they carry One out minute. are not going to achieve climate control in the next quarter century. Thank you. Thank you very much. Five minutes. I'm not sure where my distinguished opponent gets the idea that I changed the topic. It says here, be a result that human intervention can control climate change. You are arguing that we won't. That's not the topic. The topic is whether we can. Let theologians quote from the Bible and let scientists explain the science. It's ridiculous at this stage to question the science at a major university when thousands of scientists have published thousands of papers and the physics of climate change are clear. What else have physicists gotten wrong that you know about? Point of order. I don't recall hearing any comment about the science involved in climate change either in your presentation or in your colleagues' presentation. There are more polls. Uh, my, my ruling on this is the point is not well taken. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that there are more polar bears now. I've been to the Arctic. I've seen polar bears on ice that's melting out from under them. I've talked to Eskimos. 
who have, have their village being eroded away by storms because the uh, ice doesn't freeze anymore. I've been there, I've seen them, I've been to the Antarctic, talked to the penguins, you read about it in Newsday. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to, yeah. to his whole manner here, you know. Does uh, he make a point of order? No, a, a point of privilege that he's insulted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make a point of privilege also. The assumption that only the good prime minister has ever traveled beyond the borders of Nassau South. <laughs> I have been to Antarctica. I'm familiar with the North. And so your comment I take as a personal insult. <laughs> Point well taken. <laughs> All right, you know, Henry Ford said that if he had asked his customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. I think we have here some people who are wedded to an old world order. And, you know, it ought to be remembered that there is nothing more difficult or more perilous or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things because the innovator has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions and only lukewarm defenders who may do well under the new. This coolness arises partly from the fear of opponents who have the laws on their side and partly from the incredulity of men who do not readily believe in new things until they have had a long experience of them. Thus it happens that whenever those who are hostile have the opportunity to attack, they do it like partisans, while the others defend only lukewarmly, such that the prince is endangered along with them, sometimes the prime minister too. Those words were written in 1513 by Niccolo Machiavelli in The Prince. We have a new order coming, not just the old ideas of how we're stuck in the La Brea tar pits of oil. And to my other distinguished opponents saying, let's bring everybody here from all these countries and repeat the disaster of Copenhagen, let's try a thought experiment. Let's bring people here, not from other countries, but from other generations. What will people 100 or 200 years be likely to say if they're here in this room, 100, 200 years from now? We live 200 years in the future from the founding of this country. And every day we argue, what did the founding fathers mean? It's very important in our lives what they meant. They didn't say, screw it, we're going to make money. They said, we're going to have the best country ever seen on this planet. Why can't we do as well? Why can't we aspire? Why don't we care what will happen to the people 200 years from now? In fact, nobody cares if they use coal or oil. Nobody wants to use oil. What we want is our house to be warm, our beer to be cold, and our car to go. And we don't care what makes that happen. We can make that happen doing clean energy. Energy, yes, we need more energy, but we can do it with clean energy. This is economic. But forget these treaties. It's very much in America's interest to put our country back to work, to stop cowering, chasing these countries who are cynically surging ahead of us because they get it. And we are asleep at the wheel of our 20 mile a gallon gas guzzling vehicle. Europe. In 2006 became, 2006 became the first continent in which renewable energy sources exceeded fossil sources in new electric generating capacity. They are building the future. We're sitting on our butts debating it. We need US leadership. This is a matter of economics. It's a matter of national pride, and it's a new world coming. Thank you very much. Before we take the vote, who is one? First, I would remind you, there will be a reception right after we take the vote. We invite you all to come. Secondly, I think this was an extraordinary performance by all four participants, and I give them an extra round of applause.
proof has arrived. All those who feel that the government has made its case, raise your hand. All those who feel that the opposition has made the case, raise your hand. The government has it. Uh, would be any our panelists say they'd be willing to take questions for a few minutes? Go ahead, right ahead. Stand up so we can hear you. Do you actually believe the points of view that you were arguing? Oh. <laughs> uh, who, who are you directing into that? Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. Does it make a difference? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Who has the numbers on uh, how many polar bears are, are there relative to how many there used to be? Who has an iPhone? We can find out probably, right? <laughs> we can probably check who right you, Who are you directing the yes, question so. to? Who did the, who the number of polar bears? The, the World Conservation Union, and they, they assessed uh, within the last three or four years, they did a an assessment of the number of polar bears in different populations in the Arctic. The only one that seems to be holding steady is the one that's centered around the Svalbard archipelago. Uh, the, the ones in Alaska are declining, the ones in Canada are declining, the ones in Russia seem to be declining as well. If you give me your fax number, I'll be glad to mail you the citation and the data on it. So okay. you have a fax number? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The speakers uh, cannot uh, extrapolate as they did uh, that uh, things, uh, statistics will continue as they did in the past. I give you one example. Had the traffic, the so street traffic in London increased, as uh, continued to increase uh, as it did between 1890 and 1900, Everybody would there would now be waist deep in horse excrement. <laughs> that a question for anyone? <laughs> oh, over here. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, um, I just want to know that when you want to show up, when you consistently use statistics from Europe, you're taking into account that it is the smallest continent as far as population goes, and it's also the most homogeneous as far as population goes. And are you using statistics per capita or simply generalized statistics by numbers? Uh, I don't think I use. She's one of my students. I don't think I used per capita statistics, but they were relative things like 30% uh, of the power comes from wind. I mean, that doesn't compare with no, how much to, power. Compared to the United States with our population or China's population to Europe and what they're able to do with their governments to use less energy. It just, it doesn't seem to add up unless you're going per capita with your percentages. No, that's not really true because 30% of country capacity is 30% of country capacity. It's not per person and it's not total. If I had said that they use less fuel in total, like Denmark uses less fuel in total than the US, then of course that's ridiculous, a, a comparison, because it's a tiny country, relatively speaking. But if they have, 30% of their electricity coming from wind with plans to make it 50% compared to uh, the minuscule amount that it is in the US with plans to get, then obviously the point is they're way ahead of us in doing that. They do have certain advantages. They, they have a lot of wind over there, you know, but uh, nonetheless, we have an incredible amount of wind too that is not tapped. Especially here today. <laughs> Let me thank you all for being here, and I think we can continue the debate. We have some refreshments. Thank you. All.